talks about passion between the women and the men. Chris Dyer and his creative friends, darling. Ooh, 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 ooh. Arriving to Layla's on Fire Studio. Hi, welcome to Chris Dyer's Creative Friends, the show where me, your artist friend Chris Dyer, talks with my creative friends. I got all these beautiful artistic uh, souls in my life, and one of them is Layla is on fire. She's my guest for today. How are you doing, Layla? I'm doing good, and you? Amazing. Thank you for having us over your studio. You're, uh, you just moved in here, right? I moved in March. I've been working really hard to put the space together. It's almost ready, not quite, but it's getting there. Nice. Well, it's looking great. It's huge. It's, it's basement, so it only has like, a, like a one window, but it's like it's got lots of space to do good things. Uh, and the neighborhood's great. We're in the same neighborhoods where you get to keep on bumping each other on the street. I like that. Um, how, how is it, this new studio? Like, is the rent nice, the neighborhood? What, what do you like about it? I actually got a really good deal because when I got it, it was kind of, um, it was impossible to even breathe in the space. There was a lot of dust on the floor. Uh, there was no one here for like 30 years. So wow. I, I ended up like uh, compounding the floor to get the dust out. I had to pressure wash the walls. I painted the walls myself, the floors myself. I put in a lot of hours. In exchange, I got a lower rent, and now I, I, I'm building something where I could get comfortable working in. It is tough because there's not a lot of windows. Mm -hmm. That's why I've been trying to bring more plants in and uh, grass and whatever I can, and a lot of wood, a lot of my furniture. I bought some wood just so it could get more alive. Um, how do you like being in the plateau? It's great. Honestly, uh, every day that it's nice, I walk. Uh, I live in the old port, so I walk all the way to the plateau. So when you get to this area, uh, you get to see like all the street art. And then when you, you're getting kind of emo down here, I take a walk to the mountain. A lot of street art around here. Uh, the park helps a lot. It's a really good area. Uh, I enjoy the plateau a lot. Nice. And you're an artist that needs a studio, right? You, could you do this at home or is your operation too big at this point where you have to have like a giant room to make a mess? <laughs> <laughs> I actually, uh, I was working from my house uh, most of the winter before I got this space and I absolutely went crazy. I feel like any artist kind of needs a space where they could work and a space to rest. Home should be restful. When I would come in my home and I would have my paintings half done, you can't just shut off your brain and go to bed. So at night, I was always tired. I, I wasn't even as productive when you don't have the space. Two, it's constantly in your face. So you can't really see if you like it, if you don't like it, the fumes make you emotional. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's really nice. And especially when you do like mixed media like me, often you start a background and until that first layer is dry, until you could apply like the, the sticky stuff or a second coat, you have to wait for it to dry. Mm. So in a house, you can't really work on multiple canvases at the same time. You could do like one, two max. Over here with big space, you could do like four or five of them. So you could actually make a living out of it because right. it's really hard to paint. You um, can make an assembly line of art pieces. Yeah, an assembly line. And obviously you can't really spray in a house, splash paint. Okay. I ruined my floors at my house. I ruined the walls. It, here you can trash it and it's all good. <laughs> you could trash it and then the next day you have to clean up. But then at least it's not, you, when you're done work, you could leave and go home and sleep. It's not like you're trashing your home. Right. It's meant to be trashed, a studio, I feel. <laughs> right, that's uh, smart. I, I, I see a lot of decorations around. A lot of them are horror movie decorations. I didn't see you as somebody who had that darkness uh, or appreciation for darkness. Well, tell me about your uh, horror movie decorations. <laughs> I've been watching horror, horror movies religiously since I'm like four or five years old. And I just had a fascination with like skulls, skeletons, 
horror movies, anything creepy and scary. Uh -huh. A bit of a dark side I have, I have to admit. I try to like be like a positive person, this and that, but I have a fascination for for spooky stuff. Like Halloween right now is usually my favorite time of the year because I would just watch uh, uh, Friday the 13th and Halloween and all this horror stuff. It's, mm -hmm. it's just stuff I, I like, I relate to. Nice. I like toys, I like uh, Tim Burton stop motion anime, Nintendo video games, comics, mm -hmm. and uh, anything that looks scary and, and freaky or weird. And I also really like robots. <laughs> That's I cool. collect robots well, too. They're, they're getting scary too. <laughs> um, I, I, I like horror movies, but only in Halloween to kind of like feel that fear vibration. But other than that, if I watch horror movies, my imagination is so strong that I start seeing it in my life or be like, oh, maybe Freddy Krueger's going to get me in my dreams tonight or something like that. So I just kind of like, I, I can't do horror movies. I'm too much of a pussy. So you're, you're, uh, you're a lot stronger and braver than me. So, yeah, I'm weird sometimes. <laughs> does that come out in your art, the, the, the monsters, or do you don't, don't incorporate that? I feel like my biggest, one of my biggest sellers was my, my Joker piece, and it was like pretty much like the biggest monster I've made. Mm -hmm. I was going through, uh, through some stuff, through a breakup probably, so it's like, uh, it was like a very demonic piece I did, I feel, and it's weird because it's one of them that I sold the most, so a lot of people related to it. It's funny about the nightmares you're saying, because when I used to paint from my house, whether it was a combination of the fumes, my collections of horror movies, like toys and stuff I had, I would often get in nightmares too. So at a point, all the toys you see around you, I had put them in a box and I put them away for a couple of months because they weren't giving me the proper energy I needed right. to be happy. I just took them back out like a week and a half ago and I might, in a month or so, put them back. I often like to change my decor because it's not like something... It does affect you, it's true. So maybe in a month or so, I'll change for some Buddha pieces or some crystals. But now it's Halloween. Yeah, I gotta so rock it, it, that. It's, it's, a, it's a good time to take my toys out and enjoy my horror pieces. Yeah, totally. <laughs> like, horror doesn't have to be negative as long as you've uh, added to it a positive connotation or a good memory or a good vibration. But yeah, the images are kind of like violent. So then that's giving you, um, you know, images that, you know, cross through your minds that maybe might manifest in your subconscious, like dreams or uh, psychedelic trips if you do that and stuff. Like I know if I look at a horror book before I do like a psychedelic journey, those images are gonna pop up and they're gonna start dancing in my head. So, <laughs> so is Layla is on fire? Is that your real name? Layla is, okay, so Layla is my real name. Layla is on fire is my artist name. And it's all because my favorite band is Alexis on Fire. Okay. So it's like a punk rock uh, metal screamo band uh, from Canada that I really was into because I like heavy metal music a lot, mm -hmm. techno, everything. But yeah, Alexis on Fire comes from, Layla is on Fire comes from Alexis on Fire. Pretty What's much. her real name? Well, my real name is Layla. But what's your family name? Oh, Gobadi. Gobani. Gobadi. What's your Gobadi? What's your uh, your heritage? Your cultural I'm Persian. Heritage? I'm hundred percent Persian. I'm born and raised here. Mm -hmm. I speak Farsi, French, and English. A bit of Spanish, a bit of Greek, a bit of Armenian. Nice. I picked up on those when I was young because everyone in my neighborhood was speaking foreign languages. So you end up learning from people talking around you. Is it, is it the country of Persia? It's Iran. Iran. Iran, Okay. Yeah. So, so you're Iranian. I'm culturally. Iranian. I guess Persian is like a nice, elegant way of saying you're Iranian. Right. Sounds like the video game <laughs> Prince of Persia. Yeah. It sounds like a nice Persian carpet or a nice Persian cat. It sounds classy. And almost when you, when you say like Iran, people think like, oh, it sounds like Iraq. And Iraq sounds like war and tourist. And <laughs> like, that's how like a normal Westerner, sadly, would, would think. Yeah, you don't want to say you're Iranian when people ask you where you're from mm -hmm. in Miami or something like but, that. But I, Iran is a, looks like a beautiful country. Uh, like I talk to people on social media who are from Iran. And yeah. It looks like they got a beautiful country, a beautiful culture. And yeah, maybe they got like misleaded 
uh, you know, uh, leaders like any other country, yeah. like all of us, but doesn't make the country like negative. The, the, right. the problem with Iran is like people are not really allowed. To, there's not like internet. There's no freedom, so you can't like unless you're out of the country, like express yourself properly, especially for women. It's like it's a bit tougher. And then uh, it's just like a closed-minded uh, government that uh, is ruling everyone, uh, doing bad decisions, doing awful press for, for everyone. So anyways, anything on TV is false. So it's just like people are not really well educated in terms of Iran, I feel. And there's a lot of fear when it, people talk about all these countries from the Middle East, which mm -hmm. I understand because they don't they don't really know better so they just if if you base yourself on what you see on tv and you're living in the states you're not going to be a fan of iran either <laughs> so right do you yeah. go once in a while iran no i don't go to iran uh i go to dubai to do comic con but uh, iran would be a little risky for me i've been told not to go because i used to do modeling when i was young so they don't like that type of profile it's mm -hmm. not recommended for a person like me to go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's sad, that aspect of that culture. So I want to go back to when we met. We didn't meet in Montreal. We met in, in Miami. I was setting up my show. I had this warehouse that I rented, and I was going crazy with a million things, painting my mural. And I was just taking a break. And you stopped by because uh, Germ was assisting me, and you came to visit Germ, and you rolled in with a bunch of like weed pastes. You wanted to weed paste that night. I don't know if you actually did that or not. And, but you laid them all around my floor. And I was like, oh, cool. Like, uh, Layla, some fire is here. Montreal represent. And I was like, I got to go outside and do a little rapé to kind of clear my vibe. And it's like, rapé? I'm down with rapé. Let's do some. Yeah. So we sit outside and I blow the rapé in your nose. Uh, yeah. Rapé, for those who don't know, it's, uh, it's not rape. It's a shamanic tobacco and herbs powder that you snort to kind of like clear your vibration and your mind. It's nothing negative. And uh, so we did a little rapé ceremony and got to know each other a little bit. And yeah. then once in a while you would pop in and out because you're just like, I'm not going to this party. And then once in a while you come like the day after being like, Holy shit, I didn't sleep. This is crazy. <laughs> and no. I was like, this girl's a, a torbellino of, of energy. I was a firecracker. It was Art Basel. It was, I think, um, my second Art Basel. Or my, I think it was my second Art Basel. And this time I was really on fire. I was like DJing. I was doing art showcases. Every day I had booked myself an event where I would literally move my pieces of art. I came one month in advance to Miami. Mm -hmm. I over there painted like 15 pieces of art that I had planned to sell during this Basel. Mm -hmm. So every day I would like find a pop-up to just bring my art and either I DJ showcase and every day just run around. I ended up coming with all that wheat paste and street art to do, and I don't think I ended up doing anything, <laughs> to be honest. I feel like Art Basel is kind of overwhelming. Well, it was overwhelming for me because, A, I didn't really take the time to, to, to chill out and absorb art. I had booked myself so many events that I kind of like, I feel like kind of like I, not that I fucked up, but like, okay, I was doing my thing so much that I you forgot to see other people's things. Right. I forgot to take a time to get inspired. Uh, obviously, I did a burnout, which I, I usually do after those weeks. And looking back, I should have maybe booked two events instead of nine, because mm. I think I did something like nine events and like... But you just went to crush. Sometimes those Miami or Basils are like, I'm here to crush and fuck the rest. And I've had years, well, that year when you saw me, yeah. I was just at my warehouse, yeah. just selling and presenting my art and being me. I didn't have no time to go to Scope yeah. or see other people's parties or check out much of the murals. I was just working, working, working. But the, so then last year, 2019, I just went strictly to just check out scope and the art. And I threw a couple murals here and there just because people had walls and it's like, hey, might as well paint. But, uh, you know, different years you do different things. Different things, yeah. And I realized that, like, from now on, less is more because Art Basel is a really good time to network, too. So if you're constantly throwing yourself events, you kind of miss the part where 
we were supposed to go to these art fairs like Sco, Pulse, this and that, and go actually meet people in galleries in other cities so I could try to get myself in other cities because it's nice to sell on the spot and make money, but what's more valuable is making connections where you could showcase your art in different countries. So that would have been a good time because like, I remember the first year I went to Scope, I gave a card to graphic gallery in London and they liked me and I ended up going to London doing art and getting my art in London and selling in a gallery in London because of that 15 minutes I took Sweet. to go give out a card to, to people and introduce myself. Mm -hmm. But the other year where I had all these events going down and exactly I'm partying, I'm DJing, I'm showing art, you're also, your energy becomes so drained and so borderline psychotic you don't even have the right energy to introduce yourself to people because you're like you have like so much going on you're like scaring people away pretty much <laughs> so you know it's part of the learning curve it's part of the process I'm right gonna, i'm a bit wiser now and i'm just gonna like slow down and Less is more on the right. Smell the flowers. <laughs> on eh? the right, right people, right time, and just like take more time to sleep because when you don't sleep, you gotta find ways to not sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but then after that, there's because it's hard for me because I'm a DJ too, so all my favorite DJs come mm -hmm. and they all play at space, and when they go to space, it's like. The DJ is so good. The music is so good. It's one, it's two, it's three. And in Miami, it's like, oh my God, it's almost noon and you're still at uh, space dancing. And space then, is a, uh, a place? Yeah, space is like, okay, so there's a club and then there's the after hours. It's oh, just okay. space. It starts around like three, it goes on till noon. Uh huh. That's where the cool people go. So when you show. like techno <laughs> like me and you like DJs like me, that's usually where you end up being which is great for music but then for presentation uh, for like four or five days yeah. you're not too <laughs> you're getting like uh, cracked lips at the end of the situation but it, what's nice about miami is really the ocean so even if you do go party and you go crazy as soon as you dip in the ocean and you take those two hours of sun you really rejuvenate. The, the problem is... Cleans in, your vibe, all that salt water. In, in Wynwood, the, it's further from the beach. So Wynwood is like, if you wake up on that side and you're nowhere near the water and you had a long night, it's tough. So there's like two sides of Miami, like the South Beach side and the Wynwood side. Mm -hmm. And then it's hard to choose what side you want to hang out on. You want to be a classy South Beach and then, fine artist or you want to be like a super hardcore Wynwood <laughs> street artist? And then, and then if you want to go back and forth, you're stuck in traffic. It goes, it, it, oh yeah, there, that traffic's <laughs> crazy, especially during Basel, you're stuck there all day. Yeah, you're, so it, 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 it's hard to plan out where you want to go, what time, and then you have to choose what side you're on. If you're going to be on the South Beach side, where usually there's scope, but then on the Wynwood side, there's all these other conventions too. Right. It, I just find the whole week is overwhelming. Totally. Yeah, you can't see it all. You can't do it all. But um, so that year when we met, 2018, yeah. December, uh, were you renegating it? Because you're telling me, like, I got my art, I'm going to all these events and slanging it. So you're just showing up to places or you had a little bit of invitation or half half? <laughs> no, I had, I had some invitation. I had a friend who like owned a, a venue, Lemon City. Okay. So she helped me. Like, she did, they had a huge Casbah party where they had like 6,000 people come in and out. So that's for like classy burners, right? Yeah, yeah. It's kind of expensive. Like, it's like $100 to get into the party, like US. So like uh -huh. if someone has $100 to go just for a ticket of an entry, usually then they're in that mindset that was really good for me that that show I saw like three four pieces but there's a lot of stuff that I've done that I moved my art and it was a complete waste of my time too mm -hmm. that the people weren't even looking at the art that they were solely like partying so I guess the the venues I had the most success were like open outdoor spaces with proper lighting all mm. the other stuff that I moved my art to that were like closed techno parties it was, I'm not going to do that again. It was a waste of my time, and I realized it after. <laughs> but you will continue to go to Miami or Basel every December. Do, do you feel like that's a, 
an important thing any artist from Montreal or elsewhere should do every December to go to Miami Art Basel and expose themselves or at least get soaked in the amount of inspiration you see there? I really do think it's important because there's not, not just because of the Miami people that come, but from all the people, the collectors from around the world come. Uh, there's a lot of Asians that come in, a lot of uh, people from uh, uh, Europe come in. And it, it's nice to get to expose because a, lo a lot of them come for art. So it's a good time to find the collectors and to, to go out and hustle. But to be honest, one month before Art Basel was my greatest success in Miami. And it wasn't even during Basel because during Basel, there's so much artists and it's art. It's too much. I sold really well one week before Art Basel started and not mm -hmm. I sold half of that during Art Basel. Right. So I, I also think like beginning November is a good time to go to Miami. Right. So I usually that, go two weeks before. Two weeks before. Depending on the mission. Like there was years where I was just on mural painting mission. Mm -hmm. So I'd go there, meet up with Kevin Ledaw, would buy bicycles and just bike everywhere around Wynwood asking people for walls. You got a wall, you got a wall, you got a wall. And then you collect like five walls and then those two weeks are just crushing murals. Yeah. So by the time Miami Art Basel starts, people are like, whoa, a Chris Dyer mural. Whoa, another one there. And then people are like, all right, now I know who Chris Dyer is and yeah. something like that. But it's all for free every time and you can't do that forever. <laughs> well, no, for sure not. And honestly, like, like you said, like two weeks before is really the prime time to go do that. I find that more and more it's becoming like a mafia. People like are kind of exploiting artists in the sense of like everyone is trying to get you into the art show they're trying to make you pay a thousand dollars to get a boot mm. and you don't even know if their art show is legit but then they'll send you th the best way to like actually get exposure is go there in person go to the hotels go to the venues and see if they want to show your art because they'll probably do it for free but now there's a lot of people that try to make money on that and Mm -hmm. throwing art events here and there people and then, are selling walls he's like oh you want to paint my wall come and pay pay me like thousands of dollars like uh you should be paying me for doing your wall dude no, <laughs> it, it, it's weird like when people see there's money to be made other people take advantage of it right. too and uh like like any other festival i think it even happened here where like let's say merle was supposed to be an art festival and it ends up being like just a party festival where people end up just I find like a lot of the art basel like the part where you as an artist it, it's important to go is like the pre-openings the VIP stuff where the the actual buyers go because after that it's just all there's a lot of show off and a lot of partying involved so I right. find it's like the beginning of it you right. need to get those like exclusive invites to like mm -hmm. all the previews and this and right. that right the VIP openings the VIP arise openings. there for the art yeah and probably for buying or connections that's where that's where you have to get on it but after that it's just like a not a waste of time, but more like people trying to talk, 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 and just talk. <laughs> Plus, everybody's promoting themselves. Yeah. They don't care so much about you in, in many cases. <laughs> no, it, yeah, it's tough. So I find that the beginning is important. Two weeks before is important. Mm -hmm. The actually end of Art Basel, don't get your hopes up and selling right. anything. Right, some people do the weeks before, and then when Art Basel starts, they leave town. It's like, all right, well, the, my art's there. That's all that matters, so... Yeah, I so, understand. So tell me a little bit about your art career. You haven't even been doing art for like that long. How long have you been doing fine art? Uh, I guess it's about six years now. Okay. I, um, I picked up DJing and art at the same time. Okay. I pretty much went to Art Basel to party, and then I went to Scope, and I went in front of a painting, and I was like, oh, how much is this? $5,000, this is too much. Wait, hold on. I could do this myself. <laughs> <laughs> so I went home. I went to Mount de Salle. I bought the art supplies and I did something. It sold. I did something else. It sold again. And then I found out what I was doing wasn't really right because I was just cutting up posters and sticking it. And then I was told that I have to change the image, this, that. So it was a, also a learning process for me how to do like proper art and I guess... Before that, you were telling me you were a, a designer or a decorator, interior decorator? I, w I, I was... Um, I did a lot of things. I have a BCom major marketing. I did pure and applied sciences. I worked. I hated it. I went back to school nursing. I 
wasn't for me. I went back to school in interior design. And that's where I learned to do visual art, maquettes, cutting, pasting, drawing properly. I flipped some homes and I realized I don't like working with contractors and people because they would just drain you. So I, that's when I just started doing art full time and I realized, okay, I did one, it sold. I did another one, it sold. I'm like, wow, this is fun. Mm -hmm. This is making, this is what I like to do. So right. I just went on it. But I didn't really stay in Quebec that long because uh, when I started doing art here, I remember it was uh, Station 16. They told me, oh, we really like your Hulk piece. Bring it in. So I brought in my, my piece to a gallery, and I was super excited because the gallery had interest in me. And then they told me how long you've been painting. And me, like an idiot, I was very honest. I was like, it's been three months. Mm -hmm. And they pretty much told me, oh, you're amazing. You're talented, but we cannot expose you because you are not an established artist. Go and oh. come back in six years. I was like, okay. So here's the thing in Montreal. You're a local artist and they don't want to recognize you because you're a local artist so they don't give a shit about you because you're not a foreigner. Mm -hmm. They rather like push a foreigner artist and that's, that's how it is in every single gallery if you look around. You'll have the owners of the gallery that have their local artists, like maybe one or two they push and the rest is all international. Mm -hmm. So when I stepped into Miami, I was already as, as an international status, so already there you get more respect. And as soon as I went to Graphic Gallery, which has Banksy and, and Dane and what you said, huge like, street artists, they took me. And they took me because of my work. And they didn't ask me how long you've been painting. They just saw my work and they liked it. Right, face value. And then they, and I, when I went to London, I re, and then when I went to London to the same gallery, I saw like, local people walk in with their art. And they wouldn't get admitted to the same gallery I got admitted because I had an advantage there at that point. I'm an international artist, so I'm more valuable. Mm -hmm. So that's when I decided I was done with Montreal. <laughs> and I left for six years. I went to Dubai. I did Middle, Middle, e Middle East Film Festival and Comic Con over there. So I reached uh, Qatar, um, Egypt, Abu Dhabi, like all the Middle Eastern countries. They would come there. So... I got really good exposure there. I went to Mexico where I like uh, stayed a couple of months to DJ and to paint. And then Miami was my big breakthrough. And uh, after that, I got picked up at some galleries in Switzerland. Uh, and uh, there was a bunch in the States and everywhere. And at nice. the end in Quebec, I'm not even in a gallery, but everywhere in the world I am because that's right. the reality about being an artist. Yeah. Well, it's the same to me. Like I'm, <laughs> I'm, I do really good in the States and yeah. pretty much wherever I go around the world, there's people who like what I do. Yeah. And it's not like Montrealers, the people, or Montreal, the city does not like what I do. Yeah. But yeah, the systems, the galleries, the festivals, they all respect me and they work with me at some point, but they never really, you know, like I got no business here. I, I didn't get almost any murals all the summer that I was stuck here. Yeah. Even though I put the word out being like, hey, I'm, I'm in Montreal this summer, let's uh, let me paint some murals and nothing really happened until like later I found a couple of dudes who wanted a couple of small things. But that's okay with me, like, uh, but I totally understand how Montrealers, I guess there's just so many Montreal talented artists that it's hard for all of us to be recognized here. Uh, it seems like all, always the same ones are the ones who get the props. And when I look at the ones who succeed here, I don't even see their work being any better. They maybe just have better connections or a better relationship with these galleries. I don't know. I, uh, I have my degree in marketing and I could tell you a lot of the success of an artist is directly 100% related to the marketing behind them and who is promoting them and supporting them. On this day, I went, um, I was in Miami and then I was doing, I was DJing and I had my art pieces there. So they told me, oh, do you want to, uh, do you want to be part of this auction with, uh, Mr. Brainwash, Zabata, you're going to get invited to Rome. I went to meet the Pope. Here I am in Montreal, nobody. But when I'm in Miami, I get invited to fly to the Vatican, meet the Pope. They sold my art, uh, the same one over there, 
-hmm. at the auction at the Vatican for $56,000 US. <laughs> and the collector and the artist got to shake the hand of the Pope. Do yeah. I sell my art for $56,000? No. <laughs> and it's like, why was that possible? Is that the, it's the same work. It's really the presentation. Right. And it's to who's the bar, selling it. Who's like, selling this is the new it, cool artist. And who is buying it? And it's a mafia. Right. <laughs> it's a complete mafia. So when you, when you have the proper, if you have enough money, you could open your own gallery and represent yourself at Scope and put your own painting on the wall. All you need is $10,000 to get your, your And then book. pay um, an expert to say like, this is the new crazy artist that era. Do a marketing should. book. And I, no, actually I met a couple of, uh, I don't remember his name, but I was, he had started like six months ago. He was from LA and he was doing like these grenades with glitter on it. Mm -hmm. Super Simon, he's, he's, he's everywhere now. He's like, yeah, I opened my own gallery. It's all marketing. Wow. And then he got his own thing. And <laughs> Good for him. No, you know, I want Array to be abundant, but that's when like artists who work really hard at like doing something really special and, and uh, you know, presenting their heart and they all make sales. And it's like, why can't my painting sell as much as that glitter grenade? <laughs> yeah, they need, they, 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 they need to like, just like, unfortunately, like, invest more in marketing and then go, go get boots where the buyers are and mm -hmm. glorify their piece at the time of the presentation. Right. I guess that's where the galleries come in because the galleries are kind of like the experts of what's good and what's not. So the gallery got you in, it's like, oh, it's because our expert curational abilities has deemed this artist worthy yeah. to be sold for thousands of thousands of dollars. I notice a lot of things from also art buyers because I've been selling a bunch of art to some collectors. Some collectors actually feel cooler when they're paying fourteen, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 a piece of art. Like I went to people's houses where they got it like four or five pieces from Le Royer. And then like, I'm like, how much is your art? And I feel like when I say $5,000 versus $2,000, they give you more respect because they see that it's like five, $6,000 at the Lohaye. Mm -hmm. So it's also kind of like weird. You kind it's of, bullshit. You, you mm -hmm. need to just gain the confidence to actually ask higher prices and be firm with your prices. And right. this is not something that was easy. It's never easy because you know, you have to sell to survive, but like, at a point, you just realize the discounts, you just offer reprints and posters. Right. I used to sell my originals, and I'd rather just hold on to them at this point. What's your uh, your price point these days? Uh, average painting goes for? Uh, I tried to get a dollar a square inch on my originals, which is very reasonable. Uh, something like this is like $1,800. But in the States, it would be that in US. So mm -hmm. it would right. be a lot more. In Canada, <laughs> you gotta keep it cheaper for the Canadians. It's a different it's budget. Very difficult to try to increase your prices like that because people simply don't have the money. Yeah. <laughs> so it's just like you really gotta like. Right. For originals, oh, I I down. keep it in American even when I'm selling in Canada. But mm. for murals, I will just like for example, like my average mural will cost three thousand bucks. Mm -hmm. I'll keep it in Canadian for Canadians and keep it American for Americans. Yeah. It's just different economy and stuff. So, so like your your average painting will be like two thousand bucks, which is yeah, which is good, but not too over expensive. And if you sell like ten of those in a month, you're doing good. Yeah, I'm doing good. Like some, like between a thousand and three thousand. And if a client wants like more, I obviously fix it up. But also I. I play with the price with the finish. My epoxy finish is more expensive. I don't mind giving a discount on the regular finish, but I want to have to pour epoxy resin mm -hmm. and breed in like fumes for two days. Yeah. Then I, I really want to learn that finish. You got to teach me one day. <laughs> it looks, gonna, looks very classy. Uh, it, it's cool. It's shiny. It's just lethal. <laughs> it just looks like glass, you know? Yeah. Like, like, so, and you don't even put it on a box. You just kind of like drip it and it just drips down and that's I funny. drip it and I make it flow on the side. Mm -hmm. What I like about epoxy is that um, it really makes the colors Let's say marker in something, it rises in the epoxy. And if I do a second coat of epoxy and I had sprayed it on there, so it really looks like three dimensional sometimes. 
And right. when I do some mixed media, it kind of like brings out the colors. It pops things up. Yeah, this, it, this one has oil on it, so it makes the oils come out. It's just... Creates, incre it increases the saturation in a way. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I varnish my pieces just with like varnish medium, and I like how it pops it up, and it protects it a little bit, you know, for when it gets banged up in, in transit. I got a friend who does the expo expo expoxy, epoxy, epoxy, yeah. epoxy uh, thing, but he'll do like 10 to 15 layers of it. So he does a giant box, it will be a giant piece, and he does one layer of, of collage, does a layer of epoxy. Next layer of collage, another layer of epoxy. So it ends up being like kind of like a cake with different things happening at different points. So when you see it, the whole thing kind of moves like a hologram in a way. Yeah, so no, it's, it's cool stuff you could do with the epoxy layers. You yeah. can go unlimited. It's just heavy and super expensive. Yeah, how much does it cost to do like a, 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 a epoxy finish on a canvas like this? Like, let's say my, my bottle of epoxy, like the big one is like 250 But like, let's say for this one, I could use a small... I would say the cost in materials is around $100 more. Okay. But plus two full studio days. Right. <laughs> so you have to flame it mm -hmm. for six hours every 30 minutes. Wow. So it's a lot of work involved too. Gotta and get those it, bubbles out, huh? Yeah, I get the bubbles out. And the epoxy himself, like $200 for like... A bottle so it's like a hundred but you have to spend at least 200 to 250 dollars to get the material of the mm. epoxy so you work really hard at your art i kind of do yeah <laughs> <laughs> T <laughs> tell me about your art what what is it about generally i know it's pop art it's got a tint of street art um is there a general message for your art or does it depend on the piece uh Tell me a little bit about it. I, I used to do a, a lot of street art. I used to do a lot of superheroes around the back alleys because I wanted like heroes to save the world. I used to write messages on them. I had um, I had some some stuff happen and uh, I couldn't really talk about it. So I ended up writing about it on all my characters and it was a certain way my it's my art is my diary pretty much on the back of the pieces and on all the images i write everything from like that's on my mind people that hurt me relationships i've had family issues boyfriend issues friend issues i pretty much write everything on it like the things i want to say and then i just go put it on the street and it's like kind of my way of like releasing myself sometimes mm -hmm. So I, it's, it's kind of like a shamanic process of self-healing by getting out the energies that you're dealing with. Yeah, yeah. And especially, not only that, I, I'm very sensitive to war around the world. Uh, right now, like, there's a war happening with Armenia. Right. And every time, like, I, I, I watch, like, TV or, like, the news and stuff like that, I get these energies and then I, I have to like put them onto something. So it's a nice way of me of like liberating myself and just like getting it out there. Mm -hmm. um, my, one of my breakups was like I was writing a lot and just putting Wolverines everywhere. The Joker was pretty much also my breakup in men. And then I started doing more like iconic pieces like Dali, people that influenced me. Um, being like beauty i did sophia loren pieces i pink panther with dj stuff just stuff that i like i like comics i like heroes mm -hmm. I, I did a lot of uh, and even though this these pieces are very personal to you yeah. the client might not even know what it's all about they just see the picasso or the or the character that they already have a relationship mm -hmm. with but with a flair or a twist that they might have not seen before but for you it's all about the flair thrown on top almost right well, it, or how it, it plays it, with it, the character it's it, it's everything i mean like when i was in in miami i was doing a lot of einstein pieces i was like in my thinking mode phase but i was doing a lot of jean-michel basquiat i feel like I don't really know what's my style. I just get influenced as I go. Sometimes I'll just like be around chill people and then I'll go paint a Buddha or someone's gonna make me angry. I'm gonna go do like a Joker. Uh, some days I'm more into collage. Sometimes they paint. I, 
I've been told by some gallery owners that I need to choose one style and stick to it. Right. I absolutely do not think that's real or necessary. I find that, okay, it's cool to have a certain style, but it gets so boring to do the same right. thing over and over again. Yeah. It kills the fun process to it. Mm -hmm. So I feel like every three months, it's okay to recreate yourself, uh, do charcoals, paint. Uh, try new mediums. Try new mediums. Topics, Topics, because it's very, it gets very boring. It gets boring. Yeah, you don't want to be bored as an artist. Like, it's a fun job, but if we're just doing it for, like, the money or yeah. to be famous or recognized and all that stuff, yeah, we kind of want that, too, but that's not the end purpose. The end purpose is to be happy with whatever you're expressing yourself yeah. through. So I, I'm, I'm okay with not following whatever gallery told me to do and uh, keep doing my own thing because, anyways, they're not the ones doing anything for me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, good for you. So you're not working with many galleries then? I was working with one gallery in Montreal and I could affirm that I've been robbed. They told me to give my images that they're going to just print it on plexiglass with my signature on it. Funny, I go to Miami, I go to Toulon, I come back and I get snaps of people's, my, my art printed on plexiglass and it's all oh, cool, it was sold a year ago. Where's my royalty? Did they give oh, you we forgot. You know, like, this is why, one, I don't want to work with galleries. They take 50%. Who's that gallery? Oh, That's the one that Rob knew as well, Candy. They reprinted my, my stuff on plexiglass. I caught two plexiglasses of my stuff, printed out and sold. And I, they sent me, like, $44 for a huge Amy Winehouse piece uh, showing me, like, a phony uh, a bill, like... I, it just, like, it made me bitter. So I, I kind of... What's went, the name of the gallery? Sorry. It was My Wall Candy. My Wall Candy? Yeah, My Wall Candy. Okay, cool. So they reprinted my stuff. I caught it and I... <laughs> he paid me like $40. Jesus. Uh, 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 a whole year after. And I just, like, I don't really... Once... You, Trust is broken. I don't give my images to anyone. So a lot of people approach me that they want to work with me. The only thing I would ever give to a gallery at this point would be an original. I would never give my image to anyone ever again. Mm -hmm. Everyone I ever given my image to stole from me. It happened to me in Dubai too. Aww. So I just like... There's a lot of bootleggings out no, there. No, it, it's tough. It's tough. Yeah, I got a lot of that, like, you know, I see my art being reproduced by different brands around the world, selling my art without crediting me, making profits, and because coming out of China, you go up to them and be like, hey, that's my art, uh, you're going to give me a cut, and you never hear back from them, and you know, how do you stop them? At, th at this point, it's just like, well, more medicine for the people, more. whatever, I'll get my karma rewards one way or another, so I'm blessed, I'm sustained, I'm not going to lose my uh, happiness because of the negative actions of other people. That's their process, I yeah, guess. Yeah, there's been a lot of like people still, like even in Montreal, there was like someone doing wallpapers of like Sticky Peaches' art and stuff. I mean, Sticky Peaches doesn't do a sell of wallpaper. Mm -hmm. And suddenly there's like uh, this guy selling a wallpaper of Sticky Peaches' art and stuff like that. People will literally just come take a picture of your image and steal it like that. So mm -hmm. you, you gotta get ready to have thick skin in this industry, I feel, because like the more you grow, the more you're gonna have people around you that just want to come feed off for free. So yeah. I understand how why artists sometimes like they have like bad tempers or are difficult to talk to or like it, it, when people want to talk to them about business, it's tough. You know, you have to like protect your time on everything. Even me, when people are like, "Oh, I have," a, can you come to my house? I need four or five paintings. You need to charge them $200 to just go there and look at the walls because they're right. also just going to go there and ask a million questions, and take then, all your energy, yeah, and then just like <laughs> not work with you. So yeah. I got that problem. I'm too, too nice yeah. as an artist. Like, I always think that everybody's going to act correctly. Yeah. So I, I had one of those situations this summer that like, hey, come and paint murals at my buildings. This is the budget. It's like, oh, that works. Go check out the building, do my sketches. So pretty much spent two days. And he knew my art, that's why he contacted me. And then it's like, okay, these are the sketches, what am I gonna do? Like, oh, 
no, 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 I don't want you to do that. I want you to do like a landscape of Montreal with bikers on it. It's like, okay, so you want me to do a landscape of Montreal when we're already in a landscape of Montreal? Can I just do my thing? Yeah. No, 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 I want you to like do art that's classy for people so then I can hike up the rent of my business gentrification mode. And I'm like, uh, no, I got my style, dude. That's why you contacted me and yeah. I'll do this and it's gonna be special. I already spent 500 bucks on spray paints. I'm ready to go tomorrow. No, 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 no. you gotta do what I want because I'm the boss and I know better. And that was that for that job. Uh, yeah. So it's so frustrating. It's like, fuck man, just trust me. I'm the artist here, you know? Yeah. You're, a, you're a landlord, you don't know what's cool art. But he's telling me, no, I want your art to be cool. I was like, fuck you, dude. No, it, it's tough. <laughs> Working with people is definitely tough. That's why I couldn't do this. That's why I also like working on canvas directly, because then you know it. It's like you like it or you yeah. don't, you know. Right. So I do a lot of work on canvas. If he doesn't get it, somebody else will get it. Yeah. That's it. So in these six years, you've enjoyed your art career, and you're you're doing good sales. You're being abundant. And you're really expanding your roles. You, te you told me that you started teaching younger students now. I actually started giving some art lessons uh, uh, because, you know, COVID happened. So we're all adapting <laughs> adapting to like other stuff. And I was a DJ. I'm not DJing as much anymore. And I had like people message me, oh, do you give art lessons? I started giving art lessons and I'm really enjoying it because I had people come to me where they weren't even painting well and now they're making art and not like completely my style but kind of my style so it's kind of nice i feel like I, i'm planting little seeds of myself everywhere and right i, 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 I think it's better if the student doesn't do your style because yeah. that allows you to still be unique while the student can find their own way of self-expression but with the energy you're giving them right yeah. i find that's uh that's a good service you're providing um, and so you say you're not DJing so much, but how is your, your side, is it a side gig, the DJing, or is it as, as big as the art? It was as big as the art until COVID happened. Mm -hmm. I was pretty much... Um, what kind of music? Uh, techno, minimal tech, mm -hmm. uh, like Bohemian, Bohemian vibes of techno, Arabian house, Middle Eastern vibes pretty much. I was going to have a full-time gig, obviously not in Quebec. I was going to go to Mykonos. I was supposed to play at Scorpios for three months. Okay. Every day. Mykonos so, is a country? It's, a, it's in Greece. It's an island in Greece. Oh, you always go to these like paradise, <laughs> beach, Ibiza, Tulum kind of, and they want you, they're all like DJing in bikini yeah. and stuff. <laughs> no, it, it's good because like, I guess... The advantage of being an artist is that you can paint wherever you want. I mean, you right. go to Peru, right? You right. go to the mountains. Of, it's, it, it, it's the fun part where you could just go and do what you love anywhere in the world. So obviously I'm attracted to beaches and bikinis and I would live in a bikini every day if I could, to be honest. It's my favorite outfit. <laughs> so, right. so I'm just attracted to that vibe. And also my, my type of music is very popular over there. Right. So it's like, it, it's a bit tougher here. You know? uh -huh. It gets dark at 5 p.m. No one wants to hear your, your beautiful like, uh, beach music when it's freezing over here. It's not the same energy. Right, it's so. a different vibe. You gotta, <laughs> at least if the music you were playing before was the kind of music you play, that say like, oh, this sounds like a, like a sunrise set, yeah. uh, you know, Burning Man or yeah. something very chill like Envision Festival Costa Rica or something oh, yeah, like that. Oh yeah, that one was, sounds you, fun. Have you done that one? No, No, my friends organized it though. Okay, nice. Yeah, I, I did it 2015. It was fun but hot. Painting a mural during the day at that thing is like impossible. And then at night, it's dark and people are so drunk and the music's so loud that I'm painting my mural, but it's like intense, you know? <laughs> I've, I've done like some festival painting at the Mayan Warrior in Miami and in okay. Tulum too. Nice. It's fun, but then, you know, like, I feel like at a certain point, you pretty much need a rope around you because then people get super annoying. Everybody stops you. Like, <laughs> difference between a DJ and a painter. If you're DJing, they can't just walk up to you being like, hey, I like this song. Hey, what's your name? Blah, 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 blah. You're like, yo, dude, I'm like doing my thing here. Yeah. With painting, I guess you could stop painting, but you are actually doing your thing and you're in your zone and every five to ten minutes somebody stops like hey picture hey signature or 
you know, tell me what you're doing and you got to be polite. And so you, you're a painter plus you're a host for the festival mm -hmm. talking to every all the time. So I think that's a double job, the, the live painter one. You also live paint at parties, right? Yeah, I used to do live painting at parties. But More canvas styles, right? Canvas styles. Um, then again, I realize I really need a rope around me. And <laughs> then again, I realize I don't necessarily enjoy it. <laughs> uh -huh. After a couple, I realized that it's, I could maybe paint something that I've already premeditated in my head or that I have to paint that I already know what I'm doing. But to go ahead and create it's a hard place something to concentrate from at. scratch, in front of people with music and all this energy around me, I've had blockages <laughs> where, mm. I, where nothing came out and I, it was tough. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's a bit tough because I'm used to painting alone. So it's just you, your coffee, your music, you're good. As soon as you walk in the place, you know, like the, the people, the people behind you, the music, everything affects you. So, but I, I, I I want to work on it more, like it, but now it's finished anyways. You can't even do it anymore, so. <laughs> yeah, but if, if anything, I think this time of not life painting, for me at least, has given me a breather from that uh, yeah. performance, from being in the spotlight. Yeah, it's a performance. It's, mo it's mostly like a performance. You have right, to like, go into a character or you're entertaining people. So you have to kind of be less serious about what you're doing as a canvas, but more about the energy you're going to give out. And I realized right. that after. Because people are not even looking at the painting. Like they look at the painting and be like, oh, that's cool. But whatever happens in the two, three, ten hours that you're doing it, they're not really paying close attention. So if I'm just like going in there like I'm doing fine purple lines and nobody move me, People are kind of like, oh, that's kind of boring. That looks like a statue. But if I'm like dancing around, getting all crunk with my bottle of champagne and dancing with the DJ, people are just like, fuck yeah, Chris Dyer, go nuts, bro. And it's more like about like how hyped I get to the music yeah, yeah, while yeah. I'm painting. The energy you're than, giving. Than the actual painting that I'm Me doing. It was like when I would wear like feathers and like something nice and I'm dancing. People are into so it. We're pretty much go-go dancers. Maybe I'm just taking a little <laughs> marker and I'm like writing like nonsense in my painting, but I'm not actually like doing the art. And people like that more than... You being super concentrated on the art and not giving them any attention is no. not necessarily They don't even thing. notice, unfortunately. They don't notice that, no. So, <laughs> I want to ask you, uh, tell me more about that, uh, that deal with the Pope and the Vatican. How did you get into those circles? Uh, that was weird. I was actually DJing. I was opening for Serge Deva at the SLS in South Beach for a Soundtrary party. Mm -hmm. Soundtrary, my friends organize it. Uh, and then uh, I had my, the, the guy who organizes the party, his name is Alejandro, and he called me the next day. He's like, Leila, I have an opportunity for you. I'm like, what's the opportunity? He's like, you're going to give two of your best pieces to my friends for an auction. I'm in Miami. I'm working my ass off. I'm tired. I'm burned down. I'm exploited. At, and at somebody's asking you for free art. And someone is asking me for free art right away. I'm like, no, <laughs> no one's getting free art. <laughs> hey, Lila, it's for the Pope. Nah, I don't care. Fuck the Pope. <laughs> I'm not religious. <laughs> Do I look Christian to you? Yeah. I'm supposed to be Muslim. I'm barely even Muslim, you know? Like, uh -huh. uh, I'm born in Canada. Leave me alone. <laughs> no, Lila. <laughs> You're going to do this because it's really good exposure. Exposure for who? He's like, Leila, trust me. I'm like, oh, you know what? That's it. I'm going to do it. But I, I, wasn't, I didn't even believe it. But I gave the pieces. And then six months later, I get an email to actually go to the Vatican and meet the Pope. And it was like a, to meet His Holiness. And it's only when I arrived. With a stamp. When with wax <laughs> dripping from the letter of the email. <laughs> it's only when I got to Italy, because over there, you know how much it's respected, the Pope. And then after I met him, boom, my collectors, my Italian collectors. These are, everyone wanted art. Ah, everyone wanted so it to worked hang out. out I went to Dubai. This is Leila. It's actually crazy. Wow. What a you start using a cross. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not using crosses yet, but it did it did up up my value. And when I came back here, like the same galleries that like 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 Station 16 just like, ah, you would like, for them it's like a huge accomplishment. Right. How the hell did you get that? Because I'm with Mr. Brainwash, I'm with this, I'm with like all the successful people, and there's uh -huh. like all the 
the one million follower people, and then there's me, <laughs> the Canadian in the middle. It's, it's about being at the right place at the right time in this world. And well, no you get yourself out there. Yes. So you get closer to being in the right place at the right time. And then these people you meet in these places facilitate that. Yeah, for you, right? definitely. It's being at the right place at the right time. So being a DJ really helped me as an artist. Because the, the times where I'm focusing more on just painting, 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 I'm not necessarily actually making money, selling art. Because you need to get your ass out there and seen. Or you need a really good manager or a gallery to represent you. So it's either mm. like, there's two options. You or can, super you, kill it at the social you, media. Or yeah, but then again, if you're killing it at the social media, you're not probably, probably not killing it on the painting. Because like painting takes all your energy. You have someone killing it for you on the social media. <laughs> so it's like, mm -hmm. you need help as an artist. You, oh, yeah. you need resources. So it's like, you, you can't do everything on your own, but... Uh, you got to learn to trust some people. You will get burnt along the way. Mm -hmm. You'll do a lot of things that you shouldn't have done, but it's all learning. And honestly, I've taken losses. I've taken gains, but it's not just making money. You spend a lot of money, then you make money, then you spend money. Like last year at Art Basel, wasn't like two years ago, I sold zero. Mm. I went there, I put all my money... I went to all the all the stuff and I I couldn't sell any art at these parties. It just it was in last year of, I don't know, I didn't make a dollar, but the year before I made really good money. Mm -hmm. So it's also it's also the energy, what's going on, the, the timing, how you're feeling on the spot. One day you could sell, one day you can't. Maybe luck, maybe vibes, but... I know. think it was luck and vibes. Last year was like a bit stressful on me and I, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't good. And the year before was good. So it's just timing too. For me, it's, for me, it's kind of sad that only once you saw the Pope say like a gallery like Station 16 was all like, hey, Leila, now you're doing it. While well, your work was the same work as before. And when they were saying, uh, seeing it as face value, they were all like... Oh, that's beautiful. But because of these side factors, uh, you're not ready for us yet. But then if the Pope meets it, that kind of like fast tracks you. But the work's always the same. Like, so, you know, some, some people can look at my work and be all like, wow, that's amazing. That's beautiful. Who you with? You know, who's your gallery? Who's your agent? Who's your this? Who's your that? And I'm like, it's just me, dude. Just a dude that paints in his apartment, like sharing his love. It's like, Oh, that's not prestigious enough. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next artist who might have this like added value from society that gave you the thumbs up. It's like, why do we need the thumbs up to society? Either you like the painting or not. It's like... That's... Uh, there's a lot of marketing involved and a lot of like artists that are in big galleries have that advantage of like constantly getting exposure from the gallery and like more respect at, at like local festivals and stuff. Like being an independent artist, I feel like you really need to... To, to like believe in yourself and not give up because like even though you're good enough to be in a gallery, the gallery is not going to represent you because they have to represent themselves first. And by exposing your art or my art, it could take away from sales of their own art or their body art that they're representing. Mm -hmm. So they're not necessarily going to put something as good as them or even better because it would diminish the value of their own stuff, you know? So they want to see you do good, but never better than them type thing. That's so weird. <laughs> you got to idea and open up your own thing and do your own thing and keep pushing your own thing, you know? You, you can't be sad because a gallery turned you down. A mm -hmm. gallery is a business. It's not, it's not everything, so... It's cool that I got some respect out of some people, but I didn't really change anything. I, like I just like kept painting, kept painting, kept painting, and and right. I didn't necessarily want to be more in galleries after the thing happened with the Pope. I actually wanted to keep more art sales right. for myself because I, I had more confidence to boost up my own price. And you don't have to give that fifty percent neither. Not only fifty percent to the gallery, but then the fifty percent that they end up giving to you is declared money. So then twenty percent goes back to the government. Mm. A lot of sales are cash in the art industry and is 
<laughs> that kind of like helps. Mm. <laughs> and then a lot of, you know, it's just like avoiding the tax, this, that, it helps, you know. Nice. I don't know if I should say it, but yeah. No, it's good. <laughs> it's good to be honest about our points of views. You, like, you get 30% back when you're selling at a gallery because you get taxed on that um, right. money they give you. Whenever I'm in a show, and I like to be in shows because I want more people to see my art, but secretly I'm like, I hope it doesn't sell. Even though I'm going to lose the money from my shipping investment, yeah. if I don't sell it, one, I get to keep it longer and I like my art and I like to like live like surrounded by my art but two when i sell it on my own then yeah. i make a hundred percent of the situation hundred percent profit is always the way to go totally so you are a person who like does a lot of things you got all this energy uh you know you got the art career going but you also sometimes do side things or maybe some of the things are main things like that dj thing you told me yeah. and you also uh, before you were an artist you you told me you were flipping houses you mm -hmm. were into real estate and you're teaching, and then sometimes you do some modeling. I don't know if you do that still. Yeah, I was a model for many, many years. I do take some gigs here and there, but I, um, I was a spa manager, and what I do on the side now, I do microblading eyebrows. It's a form of art for girls that have like stringy eyebrows or not full eyebrows. I like to uh, draw one by one eyebrows on their face to look make them look more appealing. Is it like a tattoo? It's a, like a semi-permanent tattoo. Okay. You do a touch-up after six weeks and then it lasts from like six to 12 weeks. And it's really nice. I mean, I have really big eyebrows, but some people don't. So it's mm. a nice add-on. Um, I give private art lessons, private DJ lessons. I am a landlord on the side. I do have some properties that I manage some stuff. That also helps um, being an artist because like if I was only to paint stuff that to sell it would take away the fun but I managed my life in a way to have like stable income on the side so I could actually paint for the love of it mm -hmm. I was getting burnouts when I was just painting stuff to sell it, it's not fun <laughs> you know you need you want to make that odd canvas the an elephant that's not sold or like a flower or something fun you know you can't just necessarily paint for people it, right. it becomes too mechanical in your head it takes away the fun of it it's like as if you're my type of music i play is not super popular here if i wanted to get more gigs i would have to play hip-hop and commercial stuff but I don't do it because I don't enjoy it. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like the same way for painting. You don't necessarily enjoy painting someone's dog or someone's portrait or someone's car. But, right. I have, but do I do it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do it. I do it for to pay my studio bill, to pay, pay my art supplies. Yeah, it's still more my... fun than any other job, right? <laughs> it's still more fun, but... I decline a lot of those. Uh, the... Unless if it's a friend that I owe him, like a favor or something. It's like, okay, I'll do your dog. I'm going to do it very, very psychedelic. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I have a hard time doing like people's portraits, I guess. It's not fun for me. <laughs> so how, how, was, how, was, how was being a, like a model, like define, like, you know, that goes with the whole world of fashion, which is a little bit of a superficial world and people uh, I, might treat themselves differently. How was your experiences with that? It was actually world? not even in fashion I was a model. I was like a, a model for this brand called Head Rush, which is, which is like a UFC clothing line. Okay. So I was pretty much in a little, little two-piece bikini around the world. Like uh, we used to go to Vegas, do Agenda Magic, okay. um, Bike Week in Daytona. I would wear like this super sexy, just little crop top and booty shorts. I would pretty much just stand next to cars or motorcycle or people or whatever and just smile, mm -hmm. looking cute. It was great because I got to travel. I got to see the world. I'm not working nine to five, a boring office job at night. I used to go out with an athlete. But it was kind of superficial and it wasn't necessarily reflecting where I wanted to be in life. So after like a couple of years, uh, you know, I, th I did it from like 22 to like, let's say 26, seven. And at the end, you know, 26, seven, you're kind of like pushing it. 
So then I became the model manager and I was the one hiring the models and doing all this stuff. But it just wasn't for me because this, this was not inspiring me. And I also started doing art and DJing at that point. So I had to kind of like disconnect from that. And now what I model is pretty much, I, I like stand in front of my paintings and I could call that modeling because I'm modeling my own brand. Right. Hopefully soon I'll make shirts and t-shirts and I'll, I'll model my own stuff that I believe in. But I don't really feel like modeling clothes that I'm not creating or it's not my style anymore because it's not fun for me. Mm -hmm. It's draining, actually. <laughs> totally. I can understand. I get so drained from modeling my styles. Ooh. Well, I got my own brand, you know, but I, I, I'm hardly the model. I, I get other people to do that for for yeah. us. I wore some of your stuff. I like it. Yeah, thank you. You're a good model for my <laughs> brand. Uh, you do a good job. Thank you. Especially when you're kicking ass, like kickboxing styles yeah. and stuff. Um, there's a story from your modeling days, and I don't like gossip, but I find this story like so interesting and hilarious. Would you want to share with us your Kanye West story? <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm not supposed to say it. Well, tell us what you're allowed to say. Like, I don't even think it matters at this point because I don't think everyone's going to track down this interview. And the whole thing is made up. The whole well, thing. But what is made up? T tell us a little bit. You met him. There, you got at, a picture. I met him backstage. I had one picture with him. But then one day I wake up and myself, I'm on the news. There's this whole propaganda about me. Uh, everyone's trying to see me, meet me, talk to me. To be honest, everything was pretty much bullshit. Everything in Hollywood is fake. They pretty much pick and choose who they want to make famous overnight, what article they want to put out on them. And then after they do some bunch of damage, they give you a settlement. And then they tell you, here's a whole bunch of money. Now you need to shut up and you're not allowed to defend yourself and you have to accept everything that was said against you. Mm. I took the money. I wouldn't take the money, but in exchange, I couldn't really defend myself and say that it wasn't true. Right. So, so at the end of the day, you get a whole bunch of haters on the internet, hate blogs, hate this, hate that. So, so it, was a, it was a tabloid? It was a tabloid, We're not yeah. going to say the name of it, but you were on the cover of it yeah, it saying the... that Kanye had cheated on Kim Kardashian with you. Yeah. A few times on top of it. Yeah, a few, after the first article, they actually put out a second one. And then, I did put the, then the third article was one that I was admitting I was a liar and that I didn't want to do They it. made a whole they made th thing. They made it. like three magazines about me. Wow. And uh, all from one picture of you backstage with picture. Kanye. But the thing is, everything is so fake in Hollywood and in L.A. They have people working for them because she was pregnant and she was about to give birth. So they just wanted to create more noise, get attention. more attention around them. As you could see, Kim Kardashian and Kanye West are still on the covers of all the magazines all the time because they always end up like doing something to be there. But that's, that's how they make their money. That's how they keep their attention. So for... To me, to give me like the amount they gave me to shut me up, that's peanuts for them. But for me, it was great because I got to buy myself a condo, a house, and and now I have tenants. And so in a way, it's like a, it's almost like a blessing. Off, off, and now I could do art. You know, it's fucking great. Plus, you got this <laughs> hilarious Kanye West story. Yeah, <laughs> I was. It was. It was a hot picture they chose. I mean, it's bullshit. But at the end of the day. It, I don't, I don't care. It's like such a long time ago. It'd be so funny if all of a sudden one day I wake up and I'm on the cover of a tabloid saying like, Chris Dyer and Kim Kardashian, she cheated on Kanye for Chris Dyer. And I'd be like, oh, it's not true, but I'll take your money to shut up. I'll buy myself a penthouse. Sure, why not? <laughs> Yeah, well, I, 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 I took, yeah. I, it's so hilarious that would happen to you, Leila. Yeah, it, it, it was quite something. It was tough at the beginning because people were really mean, to, to be honest. Like, right. at the beginning, like, people are mean. They don't, like, I got called all the names in the book. Mm -hmm. All the names in the book. And I'm a painter. I'm sensitive. Right. So I went through stuff because of that. I, I was hiding in California and Huntington Beach. I had closed down all my social media mm. for eight months. People couldn't even reach me. I was just like smoking weed. Uh, uh, doing so you it. paid a price. I had anxiety. I didn't work for a year. I had anxiety. It took me 
two years to even get back on social media. And then just when I came back here, at the beginning, it was, a, it was hell. But like I said, I didn't stay here after it happened. I went to Dubai. But even in Dubai, people, oh, this is the girl, the Kanye West girl. <laughs> the Kanye West. It always West. comes back to haunt me. Well, I hope this was a chance to explain yourself a little bit. A you... bit, yeah. Hopefully I won't get countersued by them, but it's okay. <laughs> I mean, I'll... Well, we haven't said the name of the town. No, it's okay. But... And even if they do countersue me at this point, it's going to be more press for me and my art. <laughs> right. Now you can, before you weren't an yeah, artist. I wasn't even doing art before. I was just modeling. So I, would, I didn't really have much to blow up and show. But if that story would have happened to me today, I would have milked. Now you would defend yourself and, would... and show the bullshit of the media. Yeah, and well, how they're I, I, shaping I, I, our perception of everything. I would have spoken back on it. But that's why pretty much when I was telling you I had a lot of issues, I was pretty much writing everything that I wasn't allowed to say in the superheroes. And that's how I started doing all the street art, pretty much saying the truth about what happened, that it's complete bullshit, and I actually never even touched him in my life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and... Uh, and I was just putting it out there, so it was a relief for me. But it wasn't. Uh, it was tough. It was funny. It's it's laughable at this point. I just laugh it off. You know, it's not like. It doesn't hurt you anymore. It doesn't hurt me anymore. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing it. No, it, it used to hurt me because a lot of people just. People are mean, you know. Yeah. People, as soon as they, they want to hear your side of the story, they just want to write you off, cancel you. Okay, yeah. disqualify. They're not perfect. People to... write a lot of bullshit, but also I wasn't even doing art, so then people really just like all picking on me. Like it's easy to pick on a bikini model girl, but mm -hmm. now that I just wake up and I do really what I love, a lot of people respect what I do, so they don't really begin to find these hate stories about me and bother me anymore. But mm -hmm. yeah, I've been through stuff. People well, posted me on dirty.com, this, that, like stupid like websites to bash people. Mm, it's well, okay. I'm, I'm sorry you had to go through that. <laughs> and okay. congrats for rising up, reinventing yourself, yeah. staying strong and moving past the bullshit of Babylon mm -hmm. and the Hollywood media. Hollywood is makes, bullshit. And like, you know, it makes you trust the media even more. So now that we're getting all of our reality about COVID and everything on the media, you kind of got to question it. Is this some fabricated Hollywood scenario to benefit some and maybe not others? Is it really real? I don't know. I don't know either. <laughs> How has uh, COVID uh, affected your life? You're not DJing, you're not traveling too much. Do you think you will travel this winter? I hope so. Um, I haven't traveled in a year. COVID affected me in a good and a bad way. The good is that it grounded me finally after six years of living in Miami, uh, Mexico, Dubai, whatever I was doing. It finally, I finally opened up my studio in Montreal. So that was like a big accomplishment for me. Because uh, every week I was just hopping on a plane to go to a festival, to go dancing mm. or partying or painting, whatever I was doing. And also a lot of people got some CRC money and stayed home. So for me, art really got busy. Okay, so the Serb, the free $2,000 that all Canadians yeah. get every month made it that more people are buying art because mm -hmm. they're also stuck at home more. And home is ugly. They realize their walls are empty. Uh, I'm pretty, I'm not bad at, I'm not like you on Instagram, but I'm not bad at like posting stuff. And I got really busy from March. I finished some paintings now. I got so booked up with commissions. I, I closed my commission book. I just reopened it now. Mm -hmm. I got super, super, super busy. Nice. Good for you. I'm really happy about that. But the DJ kind of died. Well, well, it doesn't have to die. May take a break. It didn't die. It, it took a break. I mean, I did play some gigs. I went to play on top of the mountain alone. It's pretty much going to be like painting. If you want to play music, you're going to have to put a camera in front of your DJ booth and play. Right. Because <laughs> you people. almost need an audience yeah. for the DJing. Well, the painting, you could do the painting and never show anybody, and that could still be yeah. rewarding for you. I guess if you were making the music and then you're hearing the music that you made, that could be the full circle that would be all you need. Though, 
you want to share I, the I, products, I did right? some DJing on this digital entertainment in front of a laptop. I wanted to cry after 20 minutes. When you DJ, you need people's energy to right. play music. I was not satisfied with that little computer screen <laughs> DJing in my living room. <laughs> I was in tears at the end. It was horrible. Mm. It, it wasn't for me. I respect the DJs that do do it. It's right. beautiful, but I can't. The energy is not the same. No, huh? it's tough. So you don't think you'll, you'll uh, go and do a little beach vacation? You can go to Mexico still. Yeah, uh, I... I, I don't know. Maybe you'll go I, to Peru for no, a retreat? No, I want to come to an ayahuasca retreat now in Peru. I was thinking about that. I, I wouldn't want to go back. To, like, If there's no Art Basel this year in Miami, I wouldn't necessarily go there because I've been going there like what, like three, four years in a row. So it's not inspiring for me. And I used to live in Mexico and Tulum. So I'll be really honest, I don't really feel like going there at all anymore. I know it like the back of my foot. It's not fun for me to go somewhere I've been to. I've never been to Peru, though, and that sounds appealing to me because it's new, you know, just going somewhere you haven't been. Every minute is exciting. But when you go to Cancun that you've been like four or five times, you don't get too excited when you see like Senor Frog or Coco Bongo. You're like, man, I used to go party there when I was 16 years old. It's not fun for me anymore. Uh -huh. It's almost a joke at this point because it's still the same show they're playing. Right. With the mask and the... It's like Groundhog Day the forever the there. Guys. Spring break never end. Yeah. Well, that's good. Well, I hope you find some nice uh, trips or maybe you'll make it to my retreat in Peru at the <laughs> end of the year. Come, I want to come here. Yeah, yeah it's, it's going to be special. I'm, I'm buying my ticket later today, so I'm super stoked. <laughs> um, so this is the, uh, you know, we're coming to the end of our show. I'd like to make some more philosophicals at the end of, uh, philosophical questions at the end of it. Do you believe art is a tool to make the world a better place? Yeah, of course. Why? Uh, because it, could br it brings people together and it like gives out energy. So when you're staring like at a nice big painting that has bright pink colors, it puts you in a happy mood. Or when I finish my yoga class and I'm walking past this super Zen Buddha, that's written on the red piece, or just like three, four words of like nice stuff. You keep, like you said, you keep that in your head and you go and you carry this energy. So I do feel if the world made more positive art and just like, just putting art everywhere, you can make the world a better place, unite people. Just the thing you were doing in the park where you had like four or five artists together. Right. Kind of like brought a sense of like, oh, you Community. know, oh, art, art is not canceled. Right. Nice, I could go to the park and find some people and do art, and that was nice, you know? Right. Well, too bad you never made it. You, you were out, you were <laughs> out in the Laurentians a lot. I'm I, such a loner. Well, I always threw my, my art in the park bashes on Saturdays or Fridays, yeah. but you rented a property in the Laurentians, right? Like yeah. Montreal Blanc? I, I have a place in Mont Tremblant, so this is every week I need to go hike the mountain to reset my brain mm -hmm. because I don't have, like, much windows here, so... After four or five days in here, I get blockage and I get like crazy and I get this weird energy. And I feel like with sports and sweating, I kind of like restore my brain and I am back to, to come here. Mm -hmm. Usually Saturday for me is the worst day. Like the, the art day is like all like Monday is my peak of like mm -hmm. and by, by Friday I start to get crazy and then on the weekend I go escape and on Monday I'm normal again mm -hmm. well <laughs> I'll hopefully continue to throw these uh, park jams and if you ever throw show them them here one. now it's gonna be warmer <laughs> yeah perhaps you know we can maybe do one when the COVID is when the COVID magically no, disappears no, no, no. or when the media tells us it's not as deadly as they told us it was and they allow us to live our lives again. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's tough this year, but I, I feel like it's a good time for every artist to just focus mm. and really make art. There's a purpose for it. There's definitely a purpose for There's it. There's a spiritual a meaning to the blockades of these days. May it be used for maleficent purposes or not, depending on which side of the information uh, we're listening to. Despite of all that, we st can still use this moment to reinvent ourselves and make the most out of it, grow, 
center and find what's our true path in life. Uh, and also I feel like it's nice for the earth. I feel like the earth is kind of taking a break and everyone kind of slowed down. So it's kind of a sense of calm. Mm -hmm. What's a bit, well, I'm, I'm struggling with the fact that they keep closing the gyms and stuff. Cause then I like. Do you go to the gym? But right now in Montreal, there's like a gym battle, right? The gyms are saying like, uh, we're blocked. Uh, no, we're not. We're still opening and fuck you, government. <laughs> I don't know. I was going boxing at Panda and I was going to Moro Moksha Yoga. So I was used to the heat of the class and I was used to punching bags. So I'm, I'm kind of lower energy than I used to be because I used to train twice a day. Like I'm doing this online stuff now, but it's not the same because... I'm not so disciplined. So at least when I'm in a yoga class with people around me, you're more pressured to follow the flow. Over here, I start doing yoga in my studio. The dog walks around. I get up. I get on. A, I'm just, you I have end ADD. up just drinking Coke Zero the rest of the, the afternoon. <laughs> I drink a lot of Coke Zero too. That's really bad. It's so good. We all got, you know, some people got drugs. You got a little bit of Coke Zero. Yeah, a little bit of Coke Zero, a little bit of rapé. Pleasures. <laughs> You know, we're, we're allowed to let loose sometimes and if that's a pop hey i think there's worse things you could you yeah. could damage in this world um <laughs> do you got some final words of wisdoms for our viewers for young artists or young entrepreneurs or anybody out there who's looking at you right now i think the most important thing is really to wake up and do what you love uh, you have to find what excites you to get out of bed and do it and even if you can't do it full time and you do it part time, just do it. Just find a way to go do it. And and um, if you don't have the support system, because because me, I never had the support system I needed when I started doing art and music. I'm Persian, right? So my parents never, my mom never accepted me doing music. Never always talked down on me never was happy i was supposed to be an engineer or a doctor like my sister so sometimes you don't even get what you need from your family to to pursue your dreams fuck what people like <laughs> uh, trying to satisfy the parents if they're not supporting you just go ahead and do it and stop looking for everyone's approval and just like look inside if you're happy at the end is what matters and that's something that, that it was hard for me to accept until this year. Till this day I don't get my mom's approval from any of my art. Mm -hmm. And I had to kind of accept that and carry oh, on. Too bad that after you know all these years yeah, they no, can't you, see that you're doing something valuable and meaningful. Sometimes you just can't make everyone happy and sometimes it can't even make your own family happy but then it's the it's the, from my collectors, from my fans, that I get the energy to continue. So I'm, I'm grateful for that. At least I got them like supporting me. Nice. So any words of wisdom, just like keep doing what you love. And if, if you work really hard and you do nice things, you're gonna end up by succeeding. You just need to keep working hard. Mm -hmm. Well, good uh, job for manifesting <laughs> the, your preferred life, you know, yeah. a life of passion and following your heart. Thank you so much for this interview. Thank it was you. beautiful. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you had fun. If you did, please like this, share this, subscribe to the page. Uh, let more people see this beautiful interview with Layla and the rest of my guests and Chris Dyer's creative friends. See you next week, people. Blessings. Bye. Next week, my guest will be Ben Jackson. Yeah, I know, right? I still do it. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, yeah, We're still skating. I'm still skating my board. The stuff at the B-roll we shot today. Uh -huh. And yeah, I love skateboarding because it's always a challenge. You're never satisfied with it. But it's something you can do by yourself. And it's a way of exploring your environment, your urban environment. It really makes you look at cities different ways. You look at how can I play with that? How can I put this together with these wheels? How can I make something happen here? And so it I stimulates love the it. creative mind of like, how can I turn this boring concrete landscape into something I can play, you know? Like, how can I play with this? <laughs> exactly, yeah. And it's always, it's, skateboarding is infinite. Anytime I get a trick, it's like, okay, cool. I feel good about myself for five seconds. Now let's do something else. So make sure to subscribe, like, and everything else. 
big thanks and see you next week. Peace.